This is the fourth in a five-part series of short vignettes to discuss the Great New England Hurricane of 1938. Today's segment, we will discuss the behavior of the storm surge associated with landfalling tropical cyclones here in New England. Of all the hazards that typically accompany our landfalling storms, the storm surge clearly has the potential to produce the greatest loss of life and property. One only needs to look at the devastation brought to our shores on September 21, 1938 to recognize the awesome power of wind-driven sea. What is storm surge? Storm surge is the above normal rise of water generated by an approaching storm over and above the predicted astronomical tide. The storm tide is the total water level that arrives at the shoreline accompanying the storm. This total water level is a function of both the storm surge and the tide as well as wave setup and the fresh water or riverine component. But for the northeast coastline there are four critical factors that ultimately determine both the intensity of the surge and how widespread it is. These include the intensity of the storm, its forward speed at time of landfall, the distance from the eye of the radius of maximum winds, and its angle of approach. Very small variations in any one of these four components has a significant impact on where the larger storm surges are eventually produced on our bays and estuaries. Historically, we've seen tremendous storm surges in excess of 12 to 15 feet in the upper parts of both Narragansett and Buzzards Bay. It is not uncommon to see minor coastal flooding arrive as much as six hours before the height of the event. And in Sandy, just one year ago, it was more than 18 hours in advance of the arrival of that system. The hot spots for the northeast include Upper Buzzards Bay, as well as portions of Lower Penobscot Bay in Maine, where one day a Category 3 hurricane, making landfall in just the right spot, will be capable of driving a storm surge of 20 to 25 feet ashore in these locations. The two graphics on the right in this particular slide are illustrating some of these principles. The upper right picture is from Hurricane Carroll, 1954. The storm center came ashore, not far from the mouth of the Thames River, and noticed that the highest storm surge values were witnessed in upper Narragansett Bay with storm surges of nearly 15 feet. Hurricane Bob, with the track slightly more to the east, produced the core of wind over Cape Cod, and as a result, the highest storm surge, around 9 feet, in the upper part of Buzzards Bay. For this reason, we preach to folks up here in the northeast to pay more attention to the side of the storm you're on rather than the exact track because these small variations can make several feet of difference in the upper parts of our bays. On the south coast it's a different story. We're not so concerned about having 15 to 25 feet of water come ashore. Along the south coast the criticality is with the wave action. In 1938 devastating waves ripped houses from their foundations. So it is not uncommon for the south coast to see a little bit less in surge height but far more in the way of wave devastation. To give you a sense of the flavor of the storm surge damage, here we have a picture before and after in Matterpoisett, Massachusetts in the community of Crescent Beach. Notice four to six blocks of homes were completely destroyed, if not removed completely off their foundations. This is an example of what the surge damage looks like in the upper part of one of our bays. Compare that to the tremendous wave damage that Sandy brought to our south shore. Keep in mind, however, the storm surge with Sandy was a mere 4 to 5 feet, but with large waves of over 20 feet in size coming ashore. The uniqueness of 1938, quite simply, was that that storm possessed both of these ingredients. Remarkable depths of storm surge high up our bays, with tremendous wave damage on the immediate south coast. Nowadays, thanks to a collaborative effort between the Corps of Engineers, FEMA, the Weather Service, and the local state offices of emergency management, we now have inundation maps, such as the one on the screen before you, that clearly outline the depth and inland extent of the potential storm surge for a given category storm. Keep in mind again, however, when looking at these maps, these maps present a worst case scenario. What emergency managers are able to do with these maps is create these evacuation zones and then from these zones the transportation analyses help to determine the number of people in harm's way, the amount of time it will take to clear these coastal areas and also allowing them to depict the exact evacuation routes that are recommended for homeowners to take. Simply put, if you live by the shore in southern or eastern New England, know your vulnerability and know your local plan of evacuation. And speaking of planning, the fifth and final segment of this series will discuss actions you and I can take to be as best prepared as possible for the next hurricane that makes landfall here in New England.